afternoon. I'm Mark Wake, Dean of the Blair School of Music, and I am pleased to welcome you on behalf of Chancellor Zeppos to this inaugural lecture of the 2011-12 Chancellor's Lecture Series. We learned late yesterday that it was necessary for Chancellor Zeppos to attend a last-minute urgent business meeting out of town. He sends his regrets, sends his greetings, and uh, is very sorry that he was unavoidably detained today. We are honored to have one of our own, Vanderbilt's own and the Blair School's own, here with us today to inaugurate this season of the Chancellor's Lecture Series. An associate professor of musicology, Jim Lovensheimer holds the Bachelor of Music, Master of Arts, and PhD degrees in musicology. He joined the Vanderbilt faculty in 2002, and he has won numerous accolades in the past nine years. 2008 was especially noteworthy. In that year, Jim won both the Ellen Gregg Ingalls Award for Excellence in Classroom Teaching and the Chancellor's Cup, the first Chancellor's Cup that Nick Zeppos awarded after becoming Vanderbilt University's eighth chancellor earlier that year. Jim is an accomplished scholar. He has written numerous chapters, articles, conference papers, and encyclopedia entries, as well as the book South Pacific Paradise Rewritten, which <laughs> launched the Broadway Legacy Series of Oxford University Press last year. He is an affirming example to us all. His commitment to his students and his excellence in teaching and his scholarly work are exemplary, even in a department of colleagues who demonstrate such excellence and dedication every day. Jim is as comfortable and knowledgeable teaching an elegant upper division seminar on Gustav Mahler as he is discussing the finer musical and sociological points of Rogers and Hammerstein. It is truly an honor to have Jim Lovensheimer on our faculty at Vanderbilt and at the Blair School. And I am honored as Dean of the Blair School and on behalf of Chancellor Zeppos to introduce him today. Please join me in welcoming Jim Lovensheimer. Very much. I, I hear an introduction like that, and I'm always looking over my shoulder to see who's coming up. Um, it couldn't possibly be me. Um, please tell the Chancellor that if I don't get a written note, this is an unexcused absence. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> um, and, and thank you um, for this honor. Nobody I went to high school with would believe I turned out to be so popular. Because <laughs> <laughs> that may change in the next 45 to 50 minutes, but that's another story. So I shall begin. As many of you know, and the rest of you will find out in a minute, on April 1st, just interesting in and of itself, on April 1st, 1943, Oklahoma opened the St. James Theater in New York City. Music, of course, by Richard Rogers, book and, music, or book and lyrics by Oscar Hammerstein II, <coughs> choreography by Agnes DeMille, who I would argue is an author of that text, and direction by Ruben Mamoudi. It was a monumental opening night, and it created a lot of drew, attracted a lot of attention. <coughs> Critical response was through the roof, and the audience response was as well. Why, you might ask. I, I heard an interview once that Sylvia Fine K did with Agnes DeMille, and she asked Agnes DeMille, why do you think Oklahoma was such a big success? And Agnes DeMille, in her inimitable style, said, because it was good. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and it still is. <coughs> But much was written at the time about the integration of, of the piece, that is, the parts of it, the book, the music, the lyrics, the choreography, the costumes, all the aspects of the show working together seemingly uh, with the Wagnerian notion of the Gesamtkunstwerk as a model. 
And the integration, indeed, was on a high level in that show. That was hardly the first time that people had tried to integrate the elements of the show, or even succeeded at it. Recent scholarship, like uh, um, Scott McMillan's The Musical as Drama, argued that integration is not really what makes these shows work, that it's the friction between the difference of the elements of the musical, uh, the difference between the spoken uh, time and the sung time, it is that tension that makes musicals work. And Bruce Curl, in his wonderful book, Unfinished Show Business, argues that yes, the integrated model is one model for musicals, but after Rodgers and Hammerstein, it sort of became the model, and we forgot that there were other ways to create shows as well. But this discussion of integration and non-integration um, it was critical. But the rows of servicemen and women who saw the show for free uh, from the rear rows of the orchestra section of the St. James Theater responded to something else, I would suggest, something that was and remains at the core of Oklahoma's ability to move American audiences. And it still does. There's a wonderful production going on at the arena stage in Washington, D.C. right now that is continuing to move people and bring them to their feet at the end. It's not the story. The story is whether Lori is going to go to the box social with her cocky, arrogant boyfriend, uh, Curly, or with this sort of strange, scary guy named Judd. <laughs> That's the story. That's it. <laughs> so it can't be about that. No, what the show is really about, and what most musicals are really about, which I hope to demonstrate today, is community. And Oklahoma was about community in the sense uh, that the U.S. was experiencing as part of the war effort. We were a community during that time, perhaps as we had never been before and have not been since, perhaps just after 9-11. At the beginning of the second act, this, this concept of community starts to become much more explicit. The song, the farmer and the cowman should be friends, which doesn't sound like much, does it? <laughs> of course, the territory folks should stick together. But the show is about, um, the, it takes place in the Oklahoma Indian Territory before Oklahoma became a state. So there was this yearning within the community of farmers and cowmen. Um, there was this yearning to be part of a larger community that is the community of the United States. A bit later in the title number, which sings of the community joining a larger community, soon you live in a brand new state. Um, you're gonna treat you great. They sing a very, very famous line. We know we belong to the land, they sing. And the land we belong to is grand. But this community is threatened by outsiders, um, and as in most musicals, those outsiders must either assimilate into the community or be expunged from it. The threat from one of those outsiders, which I'll return to in a moment, results in a death just after the wedding of the two principal characters, Curly and Lori, so we know who she goes to the box over. <laughs> Actually, she doesn't, but she marries the other guy. And this results in, in, in the following short piece of dialogue between Lori and her aunt Ellen, with whom she runs a farm. This sort of swarthy fellow is their hired hand. Lori says to her aunt, I don't see why this had to happen when everything was so fine. And Ella responds, don't let your mind run on it. Laurie says, I can't forgive it. I tell you, I never will. And Aunt Ella says, that's all right, Laurie, baby. If you can't forget it, just don't try to, honey. Oh, lots of things happen to folks. Sickness and being poor or hungry even. Being old and afraid to die. That's the way it is, cradle to grave. And you can stand it. There's one way. You gotta be hardy. You gotta be. You can't deserve the sweet and tender things in life. Lesson be tough. Well, what this must have meant to a country at war in 1943 has much to do with the emotional response 
that the show received. This was always a story in books to me, um, and, and to lots of other people. It's a very famous story, the people standing at the back of the audience in the St. James Theater, cheering with tears running down their face before they went off many times to make the ultimate sacrifice for their community. But last spring, after my lecture on Oklahoma in my music class, which I do every semester, um, a student came up to me and said that her grandfather had told her that story many times. How he stood in the back of the St. James Theater, cheering, with tears running down his face. And it brought the whole thing home to me. It wasn't just in a book anymore. It was this girl's grandfather. It was real. It was individual. And it still is. It was a wonderful, wonderful moment. Well, let's jump ahead to a later April, April 2010, St. James Theater, New York, and a very different kind of show. <laughs> <laughs> this show was based on an album by the pop punk group Green Day. It was made in 2003-2004, an interesting time in our culture. There was a war in Iraq, there was social unrest, there was an upcoming and contentious election. Forget about that war, we've got to defend marriage from those evil, evil homosexuals. You remember that election. Um, a lack of bipartisanship in a confrontational national climate that has never gone away. American Idiot was a concept album, think Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys, or later Sgt. Pepper's, even more famously, that was designed as a rock opera, think The Who's Tommy, or Jesus Christ Superstar. And in this rock opera, a character named Jesus of Suburbia, the central character, essentially an anti-hero, a powerless everyman, desensitized by what Billy Joe Armstrong described as a steady diet of soda pop and Ritalin. <laughs> he hates his town and those close to him, and so he leaves the, for the city, where he finds that the darkest corners of reality are within himself. It was a highly political and courageous album, and it was wildly successful. Grammy Awards, multiple platinum um, sales, it was quite something. And five years later, director Michael Mayer, who I would defend as one of the geniuses working in the commercial theater right now, collaborated with Green Day to bring the album to the stage, first at the Berkeley Rep and then on Broadway at the St. James Theater. They added several songs from the album 21st Century Breakdown and one of the published song by Green Day, excuse me. They created additional characters and wrote some connective narration for Johnny, the name now for the Jesus of Suburbia character. And the theme of the musical is broadened from the album, and it's now the fear that three close friends have of what they see as their mundane suburban lives, their quest to find meaning in it, and their realization in the end that the meaning they were looking for was right in front of them all along. It's a coming-of-age story, to be sure. This is John Gallagher Jr. as Johnny and a member of the ensemble in the opening number. The penultimate song in the show, We're Coming Home, reestablishes their community and brings them all back together. The aching sadness of this is that the community they return to is the parking lot of the 7-Eleven that they had left. Two of the three young men have seen life beyond that community and have been beaten up by it. And the third stayed at home and was also beaten up by it. But if in the end they cannot escape the bleakness that they had fled, they find that they can face it together. As a community, they've learned to share it together as a community. The reception and the response to the show was, if I may, if I may borrow from the title of a song from Oklahoma, all or nothing. <laughs> they loved it or they hated it. 
Now I come down firmly on the side of those who loved it. I thought it was a masterpiece and very powerful. But it was about community. Musicals have always been about and continue to be about community and assimilation and the treatment of those who don't assimilate. In short, about American life. Andrea Most, in her book, Making Americans, Jews and the Broadway Musical, which has on the cover <coughs> Ethel Merman, who is not Jewish, but never mind. <laughs> this book weaves together two narratives, as Most says, quote, the story of Jewish acculturation in America and the development of the American musical, showing how they are inextricable, end quote. She continues noting that, quote, the musical theater offered an array of techniques for defining community, encoding otherness, playing roles, and defining boundaries of the self. Each musical tells a story about difference and community. In each play, there are outsiders who need to be converted, assimilated, or accepted into the group, end quote. Or not, I would add. Oklahoma, within the community we mentioned early, features two outsiders. Ali Hakim, the Persian peddler, who's not really very Persian, who actively played the part, was straight from the Yiddish theater. <laughs> and the Theater Guild's original choice for an actor to play Ali Hakim, the Persian peddler, was Groucho Marx. <laughs> There's Persian credentials I don't know about. <laughs> the other outsider, is that swarthy, scary farmhand named Judd Fry, no relation to Robbie, <laughs> they, <laughs> who's neither swarthy nor scary. These two characters demonstrate the polarities of assimilation in the musical and of expulsion and death. Hacking assimilates at the moment he saves Curly's life in the second half. But John, because his entire modus operandi is to kill Curly, take Lori, and destroy the community, and has no intention of assimilating, is destroyed. He is the one who dies and leads to that speech I read earlier. This important preservation of community fits in with what Oscar Hammerstein II once said about the musical in general. He noted in a speech that an audience's concern about an individual, or more important to our case here, a group of individuals, is in fact, quote, a concern over the fate of all humanity, end quote. He went on to observe that this concern is directly related to the more general concern for good in the world, quote, the things that make it worthwhile for us to go on living in a very difficult world. Elsewhere in the same speech, he commented that the then contemporary musical, this would have been in the 1950s, created what he termed valid pictures of American life, and that they made important comments about that life. What made those comments important, we can surmise, is the concern for humanity that he found to be at the heart of an audience's experience with a musical. I can think of this being demonstrated no more powerfully than it was in American Idiot. The power of that show's ending grew completely from the audience's concern about the three men whose almost mythical quests they had followed, that concern for humanity that Hammerstein mentioned. The characters find their own humanity at the end of the show, and through them, we find some of our own humanity. Now, some people I talked to, especially young people, which was confusing to me, um, had trouble following the story of American Idiot. It was, it was a bit non-linear. But I, old fart that I am, had no trouble with it whatsoever. I don't know what their problem was. But in the, in the end of it all, I was profoundly moved by this show. And I think this reason, this quest, and this discovery after the quest, of the community is why. It should tell us something about the durability of the American musical and Hammerstein's comments from the middle of the 20th century are still valid in the beginning of the 21st. 
and for a show that is about as far from the Rogers and Hammerstein model as we can get, non-linear, exploding with loud, very loud, pump pop music, not too loud, very loud, <laughs> full of rage, but still at heart about community. And what Hammerstein called the concern for humanity. Perhaps one of the reasons musicals are still looked on askance as the foci of serious scholarly interest, and they are, is that we're still somewhat embarrassed by this concern for humanity. It's not very hip. <coughs> Neither is that word, but never mind. <laughs> Further, the creators of musicals, like Hammerstein, have many ways to create or suggest a sense of community. Unsurprisingly, some of these ways are musical. For instance, the scores for many shows are held together by unifying musical ideas or themes that in turn reflect community and the intimate relation between aspects of community. Even early shows, which we might think of as almost primitive in their structure and content, can be rather sophisticated in how they accomplish this. For instance, 1927, showed arguably the first great musical, score by Jerome Kern, book and lyrics by Oscar Hammerstein II. The first scene of Showboat exploits a three-note cell, I'll call it. We could call it a pitch class, or a set, or a motive, but I'm going to call it a cell. Um, and this, this three-note cell works in several ways. We may not know it as we hear it, and Jerome Kern may or may not have known what he was doing with it. I suspect he did. He was no idiot savant, Jerome Kern. <laughs> but it's there. Now, showboat is about a lot of things. It's kind of messy, but it's wonderful. But central to all of these things that it's about is the river, the Mississippi River. And the further the characters get from the river and the boat that's on the river, the more their lives come unraveled. Now, Kern connects the rivers, as the river and other elements of the show through this fundamental cell which in music theory fashion, will introduce in its most tightly packed form. And this is the form that we first hear it in, fleetingly, um, <coughs> as the African American stevedores are working on the levee. This will be for, let's see if it works again. There it is. This is from the 1936 movie. Now, I just had the cell up on, on the screen. That's, those are the three notes. You organize them by the smallest intervals and then expanding the intervals, so like the second and then the minor third. So those are the three notes. Now the stevedores sing about working on the Mississippi and and, they, and, and on the, and on the name of the river when they sing it. Here we all work on the Mississippi. Um, we hear the cell with an added note, granted. Okay, so it's the cell with an added note, but it's the Mississippi. That's the first instance of it. But now, not too long later, um, the workers sing the phrase, cotton blossom, cotton blossom, love to see it growing free. When they pack you on the levee, you're a heavy load to me. And we encounter a second version of the cell. Same notes, um, but a different order. Whoops. There we go. So we've got the original version. And then they sing Cotton Blossom, Cotton Blossom. Same three notes. So the cell has been repackaged, if you will, to refer to the cotton that grows nearby, and it's being transported on the river. The Mississippi, as we heard. The next time we hear it, it's again connected with the words cotton blossom, but this time the words refer to the showboat, whose name is the cotton blossom. <laughs> well, I have to end this just right. There we go. The cotton blossom. That's a 
rather shady picture from the original Broadway production in 1927. And you can see Hawks, that's Captain Andy's last name, Cotton Blossom on the name of the ship. Now here it's the white chorus that's singing about a different kind of Cotton Blossom. Cotton Blossom, Captain Andy's floating show, they sing thrills and laughter, concert after, everybody's sure to go. So now we have the river, the cotton, and the workers that rely on both, and the boat that floats upon it all related through three notes. But there's more. When we encounter Captain Andy, a few pages or a few moments later, there is the one on the box. <laughs> Captain Andy's a real introvert. Um, the chorus sings to him in a relatively familiar theme. The same three notes now connecting Andy, would be those three notes, the same three notes now connecting Andy with the river, the showboat, and the two meanings of cotton blossom. Finally, at the end of the scene, it's a very long scene, <laughs> we come back to these three notes, which have been interspersed throughout. And this time, Joe, an African American who works on the showboat, There we go. Here, portrayed by Paul Robeson in the 1936 film version, um, he recalls two incarnations of the cell. First, as we heard it, as part of the word Mississippi. Right? And second, in its more independent and most recognizable form at all, which Kern and Hammerstein have saved to the end of the scene. And it sounds like this. That's the, that's the motive in its first form. And it's the melody to the song Old Man River. So we have this small collection of three tones that tell us that the river, the cotton, the showboat, and the characters on both are all connected musically and thematically. They are, in other words, a community that can be musically demonstrated, as I hope I just have. And chances are that we don't even know we're hearing it as we hear it. But there it is, and we hear it anyway. Thanks to Trey Dayton for my musical examples up there. I don't have Finale or Sibelius on my um, computer, and he helped me out there, and I'm very grateful. But musical cells and motives are, are not the only way creators of musicals indicate to us what they're up to. Let's take a show from the mid-1950s that I'll bet not a single person in this room, if she's seen it, has ever taken seriously. <laughs> You gotta love him. <laughs> Little Abner is the all-American boy. He loves his mother, he has big muscles, and an IQ, uh, the IQ of a dead flashlight. It's <laughs> just amazing. Now, the musical, which has a book by Norman Adamala and Melvin Frank, music by Jeannie Paul, and lyrics by the great John Mercer, um, opened in 1956. And the style of it is a conventional pretty conventional, musical comedy with broad nods to burlesque and vaudeville and minstrelsy. And its content, which is situated somewhere between low comedy and high camp, is as political as any other commercial musical of the 1950s. And although, as Stephen J. Whitfield has noted, Broadway audiences were, quote, a metropolitan, generally liberal clientele, end quote, Walter Winchell and Ed Sullivan were vigilant watchdogs for what they deemed pink to red influences on the otherwise great white way. <laughs> Perhaps because the creators of Little Abner knew that, and knew that at least in 1956 audiences didn't take musical comedy very seriously, they were able to use the genre in general and the dim-witted southern stereotypes in particular as masks 
for their social critique, a technique long before established by Al Cap and his strip. Dale Cockrell has referred to this technique, although not in the dictionary, Abner, as moon face. Rob Walser, in his Ecologist at Case Western, has referred, has referred to this phenomenon in Lil Abner as hick face. <laughs> the function of room face, or the mask, is not unlike that of blackface in early minstrelsy. The mask, regardless of its color, serves to allow a freedom of discourse otherwise unacceptable in performance. This recalls the early writings of the Russian literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin, who wrote about Carnival in his work on Rabelais. The musical's social mass, which are of another socially marginalized group, poor white southerners, seem to have been relatively successful. The musical remains a popular choice of high schools and community theaters that revel in its high-spirited numbers and groan-inducing puns and remain only somewhat, if at all, aware of its context. Still, I maintain that Lil Abner is a potent statement about the post-McCarthy era Cold War. McCarthy was censored in 1954. And that it provides wonderfully stinging satire hiding just upstage of the singing hillbillies. Let me demonstrate how this is so. After 1949, when the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb and the Cold War arms race began in earnest, Americans lived in a state of fear about the possibility of nuclear warfare. The public was encouraged to think of nuclear assault as the unprovoked act of the enemy, something seemingly inevitable, and Americans were equally encouraged to build so-called fallout shelters to protect themselves from the lingering red radiation that a Soviet nuclear device would create. In 19... I love this. In 1955, <laughs> Life magazine included an ad for what was called an H-bomb hideaway. <laughs> Imagine. Now the worry, of course, since advertising the government suggested was from without. The godless communists would think nothing of using such devices to annihilate American cities and eventually freedom and democracy itself. Of course, they were just as afraid of us doing it to them as we were of them doing it to us. That was called the Cold War. But what most Americans didn't know was that the biggest threat from atomic bombs in the 1950s came from their own government. This was especially true of a group of people in the Southwest who became known as downwinders, referring to their geographic proximity to atomic tests that took place in the Nevada desert after January of 1951. <clears throat> the Nevada test site, first and somewhat tellingly called the Nevada Proving Ground, that's not gendered, I don't know what it is. It was approximately 65 miles, 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. And during the 1950s, that newly burgeoning center for entertainment and various forms of recreation, legal and ill, featured one other particularly unique form of tourist activity. Observing giant mushroom clouds from atomic bomb detonations that could be seen from hotel windows on the strip. <laughs> it was a tourist attraction. Go watch the A-bombs blow up in the desert 65 miles away. As Anna Russell says, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Little did they know that in 1997, the National Cancer Research Institute would establish that approximately 90 atmospheric tests at the Nevada test site, especially in 1952, 53, 55, and 57, deposited enough levels of radioactive iodine across the area to create between 10 and 75,000 cases of thyroid cancer among the ones. The damaging results of these tests are still being put. Lil Abner, remember Lil Abner, taps into the public enthusiasm for the testing in the sense that patriotic duty outweighed any personal danger felt by the public, and it does so with predictable absurdity. The first 15 minutes of the show are pure burlesque. The only thing that's missing are baggy pants on the comedians, which are replaced by ill-fitting overalls, and ribbon shots following punchlines, which are wonderful. 
The beautiful and scantily clad women are abundant. That's Julie Newmar, who disgustingly looks about like that today. And that's in 1956. <laughs> Genes, chromosomes, and a really good doctor. <laughs> And, and they, this, this costume in this presentation resembles the women in Cap's strip as well. And the early songs in the show range from the exuberant jubilation tea corn poem to the charming If I Had My Brothers. But with the announcement of a town-wide corn poem meeting and the arrival of Senator Jack S. Fogbaum, <laughs> whom the citizens view with suspicion and about whom they chant, there is no Jack S. like our Jack S. <laughs> <laughs> the tone shifts gears into satirical mode. Fogbaum quickly gets to the point of his visit, informing the population that you is going to save the lifeblood of a vigorous, thriving American industry, a glorious young industry devoted solely to the stimulation and relaxation of the American businessman, that industry known as Las Vegas. He then describes the fallout in Las Vegas that the desert testing is causing piles of dust on the green gaming tables. <coughs> the very fallout that the contemporaneous U.S. government was telling people was harmless. And he suggests that it is posing a danger to business and businessmen in Las Vegas, although seemingly not to anyone else. He continues... Does you think your government up there in Washington is going to stand by and let a tragedy like this happen to an American industry so many have given so much for so little? <laughs> he sounds like a politician. <laughs> he then informs the citizens that after a million dollar study in his name, the government has located what Fogbank calls the most unnecessary place in the USA to continue its testing. That place, of course, is Dog Patch. Just remember, Fogbaum Fog treats his constituents, your government is spending $1 million on one bomb just to blow your homes off the face of the earth. <laughs> and like good Americans, everyone, the citizens of Dog Patch, immediately launch into a song and dance. <laughs> <laughs> Don't that take the rag off in the bush, they say. Don't that take the tassel off in the corn. Fogbound adds as he exits, of all the very ordinary, most unloved, unnecessary places on the earth, they settled on your. <laughs> the song is a mere 24 measures long, but it's followed by one of director choreographer Michael Kidd's most exuberant dances. A dance that extensively celebrates nothing less than the annihilation of the dancers' homes by an atomic bomb. <laughs> This has to be one of the most surreal moments in all of musical comedy. <laughs> and its subtext is dark indeed. And this dark subtext anticipates an equally surreal moment from a musical that came about eight years later. Note this speech from a number titled Simple from Arthur Lawrence and Stephen Sondheim's Anyone Can Whistle. Convincing um, someone of, trying to convince someone of who is sane and who is not sane in, in this community. It's a very strange plot. But the character Hapwood said, most of your money goes to the government in taxes. And what does the government do with most of the money? Make bombs. But you said that anyone who makes a product and doesn't use it is crazy. So doesn't that make you crazy for letting them waste your money? But perhaps the government is making bombs because it means to use the product, which means that all of us will be killed which means that you are spending most of your money to have yourself killed. Which means that you are the maddest of all. <laughs> Performed in a serious experimental musical that used madness and sanity as a concept for social criticism, this number all but disappeared after nine performances for a while. <laughs> Lil Abner's celebration of a similar insanity um, nestled in an absurdly backwards southern hillbilly community, was performed 693 times and turned into a successful motion picture. 
and American citizens continued to build their H-bomb hideaways well into the 1960s, oblivious to any absurdity at all. But with the exception of American Idiot, I've talked about some rather vintage musicals this afternoon, but there are new ones. And by new, I don't just mean recent, but musicals that come to the genre from fresh perspectives. Musicals like Spring Awakening, which I cannot praise enough. Bloody, Bloody Andrew Jackson, which was hysterical and brilliant and had no business on Broadway. <laughs> it's an off-Broadway show, if ever there were one. A Minister's Wife, which was created by the same part of the same team that created a very brilliant small piece at the public called Adding Machine, which one of our former player students, Jane Navarro, was the musical director of. <coughs> Passing Strange, a, a much underappreciated musical. These are all musicals. Um, or many of them, at least the adding machine, and of course they were experienced after that. But these are often, um, these and other musicals, by people who have never written musicals before. What continues to draw people to the genre? Why do young people in particular find, in the, what do they find in the musical theater that makes them want to tell their stories there? That makes them want to define their communities in a musical? I have found, for instance, an enormous interest in musical theater on our campus. Not just in the people who want to perform with Vanderbilt Off-Broadway or the original cast, both wonderful student-run organizations that do very fine productions, but people who want to create musicals. Alas, we don't give them much of an opportunity to do that here. But this year, I've tried to change that. I recently got a grant from the Creative Campus Program in conjunction with the Curb Center to form two or three creative teams, a composer, a lyricist, a book writer or two, a director, to develop and subsequently create semi-stage readings of their work at the end of the year. Their work in development will be reviewed by professionals toward the end of fall semester, and I plan to bring in at least two people from New York, one of whom is a good friend who does most of the casting for the New York Musical Theater Festival, and have them take a look at the rehearsals, give notes, and help in the development of these shows. It's time Vanderbilt gets involved in supporting the creative processes that so many of its students wish to learn and pursue, I think. At this point, it's extracurricular, but I hope eventually maybe to be able to change that. I'm not sure how to go about it, but I'll work on it. In the meantime, if nothing else, I want to, and this will make them crazy, but I want to introduce some of these people to the craft of making musicals. Because craft is where art begins. Craft is where art develops. Craft is the rather unheralded foundation on which art is built. And make no mistake about it, great musicals are art whether it's Carousel or American Idiot. As an example of the craft of making art, let me quickly share a story with you about something I experienced last summer. I was fortunate enough to get a Vanderbilt summer research grant that allowed me to spend a month at the Library of Congress researching the collection of Oscar Hammerstein II. This research is in preparation for my next book, which is also for Oxford's Broadway Legacy series. Uh, they've asked me to do it and it will be a study of Hammerstein. Because of some letters I found in another part of the collection, I'm going to be a little secretive here because I found a lot of stuff that nobody knows about, and I want to keep it that way for a while. <laughs> I was looking at the boxes containing material from the television musical Cinderella. And for the song in my own little corner, which probably many of you know, a charming song that sounds as inevitable and artless and facile as a song for a young girl who dreams of a better life should sound, for this song that sounds spontaneous and completely fresh, I found 53 pages of sketches. <laughs> 53 pages of sketches for a song that on the original cast recording is 3 minutes and 34 seconds long. That is craft. And the song, artless as it may seem, is the art of songwriting its best. And what's more, I suspect that each show that is developed in this year's project will in some way be about community, because that's as natural in a musical as singing appears to be. 
Speaking of which, I started this lecture talking about Oklahoma, and I'd like to finish with that as well. When I was in grad school at Ohio State, not all that long ago, a friend of mine called me once and he said, I'm directing our community theater of Oklahoma. It opens next week and we don't have anyone to play the score. <laughs> I knew what was coming. And so I, I, my response was, was what anybody who's been in show business response would be, how much are you paying? <laughs> so once we got that settled, I agreed to do it. I figured um, it probably wasn't going to be very good, and my low expectations were not thwarted. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked like a daffy duck, and, and, and the boy who played Judd Fry was not played with talent. And, <laughs> the girl who played Lori had a rather dysfunctional relationship with Pitch. But never mind. <laughs> they had great gusto. <laughs> and they were lovely people, and they were having a wonderful time, and that's what mattered. Um, it truly was. And, and I got to get inside the show and, and spend four weeks with it Thursday through Sunday evenings playing and, and, and getting to know it again. And I was working on my dissertation, which was on South Pacific at the time. It, it was a fine experience. The second Thursday that we came back to do the show was Thursday, September 13th, 2001. <laughs> well, needless to say, that was all we could talk about when we came in. Those of us who lived in the city, those of us who knew people in the city. We had one girl who had been in the city and had to get a bus to come back to do the show. And we went in and we went out and did the first act. <clears throat> then we went out into the second act. It seemed fairly normal until we got to that speech. I don't see why this had to happen, Lori said when everything was so fine. And Aunt Ella said, that's the way it is, cradle to grave. And you can stand it. There's one way. You gotta be hardy. You can't deserve the sweet and tender things in life. Lesson or tough. And you could have heard a pin drop in mm -hmm. that auditorium. And I sat there with my back to the audience and I thought, <coughs> my God, this show, 1943, has just become relevant all over again in a way that it never was before. And every single person in that auditorium felt that. It wasn't about World War II anymore, and it certainly wasn't about who Lori was going to go to the box social. At that moment, it was about nothing less and nothing more than that moment. That people in the auditorium were sharing, and that the entire country was sharing. <clears throat> and that moment, was about community on a rather grand scale. Oklahoma means something different, at least to me now, than it ever did before and may ever again. But I thought it when I saw it in Washington this day, production of the Arena Stage, and that speech came. That's all I could think of. Do people know? Do people know how important this is? Do people know how resonant this is with American life? I hope so. Because we knew it on Thursday, September 13th, 2001. <laughs> Oscar Hammerstein said in a quote that I found, I sent this quote to Mark in an email. I found it the first week I was there. 
And the last word of the sentence you can take in any way you want to, whether you're religious, whether you're an atheist, it doesn't matter. The quote stands. He said, good theater is an expression of a miracle. <coughs> well, don't you wish you had said that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> good theater is an expression of a miracle. Musicals, though some people dismiss them as mid-row, <laughs> mid-cult, like Dwight Dunn referred to Oklahoma and South Pacific as middle-brow entertainment. Of course, he thought the Book of the Month Club was an insult to the intelligence of well, his group, anyway. <laughs> what do you think? People who dismiss them and say, oh, musicals, well, whatever. Don't get that they can be good theater. They can be great theater. Go see a really good production of Sweeney Todd sometime. And good theater, great theater, is an expression of a miracle. And what else, I would ask you, is community, but a sort of miracle. People who may not even like each other getting along, working together. And this, I argue, is what is celebrated in the American musical theater over and over and over again. Sometimes in really good shows, sometimes in not so good shows, but over and over and over again. This miracle, if you will, this sense of community, and this art form which belongs to us, Andrew Lord Weber does well, but it's not the same. <laughs> the musicals belong to us. Because they are about us, as John Bush's book title says, our musicals, ourselves. They are that indeed. They are our community. And because they are us and our community, I suggest to you, is precisely why they matter. Thank you all for coming. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.